ATP phosphorylates creatine to form creatinine phosphase <clears throat> in a reaction catalyzed by creatinine kinase. Kinase is an enzyme that is a catalyst to the conversion of the inactive enzyme into the active enzyme. Creatine phosphate provides a small reservoir of high energy phosphate that readily regenerates ATP from ADP. The CP plays a role during the early stages of exercises in muscle where large quantities of the CP are found. Creatine aids in transports of high energy phosphates from the mitochondria to the actomyosin fibers. This is the biochemistry of what I just explained in that last slide. You do not have to know this uh, biochemistry or uh, chemistry sheet here. It's just to show you what's going on. The kidney is involved. The liver is involved. And muscle and brain is involved. So in the kidney, glycine um, when acted upon by the arginine or niacine will eventually get converted into the guanadinoacetate in the liver which when it goes through its cascade of events uh, including being acted on by the SAM or the s methionine, will create the creatine when acted upon by the creatinine kinase converts you get this energy ATP and ADP and then creatine uh, the creatine phosphate is eventually uh, converted into the creatinine which is the ultimate byproduct and breakdown of this stuff and then it's expelled in the urine okay I'm gonna say something clinically and I want you to write this down it's a couple things it has to do with compartment syndrome, which is when a muscle gets hurt, it will swell really aggressively inside of the um, epimyceum. The muscle can only swell so much before it starts to cut off its own blood supply and the swelling continues and the swelling and the bleeding and the bleeding continues within that muscle within the epimyceum and that's very bad now what happens is one of your clues is extreme pain and history of trauma over the muscle site and also uh, this creatinine will spill into the urine and the urine will have um, you know like a, a reddish color a brick red color because now you're spilling byproducts of urine into the uh, or byproducts of creatinine into the urine so this is now in the family of rhabdomyolysis or for slang rhabdo okay so uh, those of you who are going to be in hospital s settings uh, this can happen especially you nurses uh, this takes time to develop so sometimes after people are checked in examined etc and they're put into a room and you're monitoring them if they start complaining of extreme pain over the muscle injury site where they were hurt check for swelling and so on and also they may be catheterized to so look in the cath bag for um, you know that red brick colored urine and and or labs okay to see if uh, the creatinine and or creatinine phosphate levels are high if they are do be suspicious of compartment syndrome and rhabdomyolysis that is an emergency surgery and if you don't catch it or it's missed or if the surgery is not done they can lose that tissue or lose the limb it can be that bad Okay, and they have to release it, so they just simply make a, a scalpel incision to let the pressure and the blood drain out. And then you have to do your wound care and anticoagulants and be concerned about blood clots and so forth. So it's quite an aggressive and complicated and long drawn out procedure, but it is very necessary if you're going to save the tissue or save their limb.
compartment syndrome, and rhabdomyolysis. Okay, muscle cells store about five times more CP than ATP. The ATP lasts about four to six seconds, and then the CP will last up to about 20 seconds. Okay, so remember, this is all under one of the forms of energy, direct phosphorization. The second one is respiration. Okay, aerobic means with oxygen. At rest, rest and during light to moderate exercise, about 95% of ATP used for muscle activity comes from the aerobic respiration. And that should be uh, right here, comes, not cones, comes, C-O-M-E-S, comes from aerobic respiration. The aerobic respiration occurs in the mitochondria and uses oxygen, which these pathways are oxidative phosphorylation, which basically is a formation of a high energy bond by getting that phosphorus onto the ADP. It's just using oxygen instead of CP in this case. Glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. Some of that en energy released from this breakdown is captured in the bonds of the ATP molecules. And the aerobic respiration provides a rich ATP supply of about 36 ATP per glucose. It's slow. It does require continuous delivery of oxygen and nutrient and fuel to the muscles for this to work. The third one is anaerobic glycolysis and lactic acid formation. Okay, glycolysis, which is the initial step of glucose breakdown, does not use oxygen. Anaerobic means and without oxygen. This glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of the cell. Glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid. Small amounts of energy are captured in ATP bonds. So you get two ATP for one glucose molecule through this method. Pyruvic acid now enters the aerobic pathway that occurs in the mitochondria to produce more ATP. However, when muscle activity is too great, making oxygen and glucose inadequate to meet the exercise demand. The slow aerobic mechanism cannot keep up with the demands for ATP, so the pyruvic acid generated during this glycolysis is converted into lactic acid. Okay, this overall process is the anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis produces about 5% as much ATP from each glucose molecule as aerobic respiration. But anaerobic glycolysis is two and a half times faster than aerobic respiration and can provide most of the ATP needed for the 30 to 60 second strenuous muscle activity. Anaerobic glycolysis uses huge amounts of glucose for small ATP harvest, and it accumulates lactic acid, promoting muscle fatigue and muscle soreness. Now, some newer research is um, almost refuting this. Now, I'm not going to split hairs over this, but this is where some of the soreness comes from. Um, but it's also one of those things, uh, it, you know, if you're new to an exercise or an activity, you're going to be sore at first. But the more you do it, the more you stick with it, you eventually, uh, your muscles will get used to it. They will adapt and they won't be so sore anymore. So with muscle fatigue, if you exercise for a long time, the muscles obviously will eventually fatigue. And when that happens, the muscle is unable to contract even though it is still being stimulated. And this is usually because of oxygen deprivation. So the muscle is dependent on the blood supply, bringing red blood cells, hemoglobin, 
and oxygen is attached to the hemoglobin and when muscle oxygen deprived uh, and lactic acid surfaces via the anaerobic mechanism this deprivation will cause ATP to run low so with the increase in lactic acid and the decrease in ATP the muscle will contract less effectively Okay, so this is one reason why you increase your breathing in during exercise is to get more oxygen in you, which will eventually deliver more oxygen to the, into the blood, which will deliver more oxygen to the muscles. And one of the ways that we adapt is by actually creating more red blood cells. That's a process called erythropoiesis that you'll learn in ANP2 um, but that is one of the responses to exercise is you're going to increase more mitochondria uh, more muscle cells more oxygen carrying capacity and so forth these are some of the reasons why you're less sore later on if you continue with the exercise activity with muscle tone skeletal muscle activity is constantly occurring where you feel it or not so there's this constant electrical um, synapse that's just taking place to muscle. So they're, to some degree, always contracting. This allows the muscle to stay firm and healthy and constantly ready for action. This state of continuous partial contraction is called muscle tone. This occurs because of the different motor units being stimulated by the nervous system. Okay, some effects of exercise on the muscle. If the muscle is not stimulated properly over time, disuse will cause atrophy. And this is where the muscle will um, shrink in size, atrophy. If you stimulate the muscle, the muscle can increase in size. That is hypertrophy. This is where the muscle gets bigger increases in size okay some examples of aerobic uh, that's endurance so you're jogging running marathon runners you know long distance biking swimming etc so these things use a lot of oxygen this uh, aerobic exercise does result in stronger more flexible muscles and then some of the benefits you get from aerobic exercise is increased blood supply, more muscle cells, more mitochondria, more oxygen. It improves digestion, it's healthy for skeletal muscle, increases metabolism, enhances neuromuscular coordination, enlarges your heart in a good exercise way. Stroke volume increases. Stroke volume means that when the heart squeezes, so one beat of the heart, you eject a lot of blood. You have very good stroke volume. Lungs improve in their gas exchange. Tons of benefits that comes with uh, aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise is also not necessarily designed to increase the size of your muscle. That would be anaerobic. Building muscle mass comes from anaerobic type workouts with the resistance and isotonic type exercises which is eccentric and concentric contractions for example bicep curls you grab the bar or the dumbbell with your hand and you just bend at the elbow okay so the muscle gets shorter the muscle gets longer the muscle gets shorter the muscle gets longer the result is the breakdown and buildup of muscle tissue you get enlargement of muscle cells, more contractile filaments. This is all part of the growth and repair phase of um, lifting, like that type of exercise, anaerobic exercise, weight training.